Well, good morning, church family. How are you? Are you well? Are you excited? Is God good? Is he faithful? All the time he is, all the time. I want to show you another picture uh, that we took in Israel. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, And what you are looking at in front of you is one olive tree that is actually more than 2,000 years old. An olive tree continues to grow and it hollows out on the inside and it gets wider and wider and wider. That's why this one is so wide. But think about this. A silent witness to 2,000 years ago in the garden. Luke 9, 51 tells us that when Jesus was in Galilee, that he set his face toward Jerusalem. He set his face toward Jerusalem. And as you walk through the Gospel of Luke, from that moment forward, for weeks, Jesus is intentionally moving towards Jerusalem, towards the suffering that he know awaits him. The Garden of Gethsemane is the greatest act of faith in history, where Jesus is begging his father if there is any other way, and yet he surrenders his will to the father's, trusting that God will bring good out of suffering that God will vindicate him from ultimate shame. In our passage today, Paul too has set his face toward Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 20 and Acts chapter 21, we are told that bond, bonds and affliction await him. And yet he continues to move forward. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20 and Acts chapter 21. As we continue and pick up our narrative, our walk through the book of Acts. This morning, we're gonna uh, gonna cover uh, in a large scale narrative, Paul's movement, as I said, towards Jerusalem. In today's passage, we will see Paul's heroic step of faith. That If I'm honest, in my opinion, and in the storyline of Scripture, Paul's act of faith here today is second only to Jesus and his move towards Jerusalem and Gethsemane and the Passion. So get ready, buckle up, and let us pray that our faith would grow mightily today. Amen? All right, so listen as I read in Acts chapter 20, the first three verses of Acts chapter 20. By the way, if you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us to you and make it your own. Acts 20, beginning in verse one. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone through those districts and he had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. Now Greece, here he probably stayed in Corinth. And there he had spent three months. And when a plot was formed against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. You guys pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning with great hope and expectation that you have promised to meet us in your word. And we are crying out right now in Jesus' name that your spirit would teach us, would convict us of the faith that we need and then would encourage and implore and give us that, stir up our faith, God, so that we would walk with you in an incredible way, that you would be glorified in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
So in our text, if, if you recall, Paul had spent three years in Ephesus. And after that, God has called him to leave. God has called him forward. And that's the part where we read, where where Paul will circle back through, he will visit churches in Macedonia, and then he will go and he will spend just a short time in Corinth. Paul senses that the Holy Spirit is now calling him to return to Jerusalem. You see, it has been 20 years since Jesus appeared to Paul in the temple, telling him to leave Jerusalem. After Paul was was run out of Damascus, he went back to Jerusalem uh, with the hope of being able to testify to all the people that he had, uh, uh, that knew him. And, And he goes back and he's in the temple and one day Jesus appears to him and tells him, you gotta leave. Paul is perplexed. He argues with Jesus. They know me. I know them. Certainly, they they will listen as I testify about you. And Jesus says, listen, they won't go. Yes, Paul has been back to Jerusalem a few times on quick occasions, but I certainly imagine that he kept a very low profile, avoiding the temple, avoiding Jewish leaders, knowing that he had become a most wanted man in Jerusalem. But now, 20 years later, the Spirit is stirring in his heart to return. And so he aims to celebrate the Passover back in Jerusalem. Intending to leave Corinth, he's gonna sail to Syria and then make his way to Jerusalem. But at the last minute, Paul is warned of a plot to kill him once he gets aboard the ship. You see, Paul is well known in Corinth, right? He's very recognizable. And there are assassins who intend to blend in, get on the ship, wait till they are journeyed out to sea, and when Paul is most vulnerable, to strike him. So Paul makes an emergency adjustment. He apparently uses his entourage as a decoy. They board the ship while he slips away and will subsequently travel over land all the way back up through Macedonia, and they hope to rendezvous at Troas. You see, his plans of of reaching Jerusalem by Passover are shattered. He will have to travel alone, okay, all the way until he gets to Philippi, where he will celebrate the Passover there in Philippi, And wouldn't you know it, he bumps into Luke, our author, there in Philippi. You see, Luke will travel with Paul from there to Jerusalem. Luke will interview Peter and John and Mary and John Mark and other eyewitnesses. He will begin to compile the gospel according to Luke. Do you guys recall that this is actually the second time as we've walked through Paul's uh, missionary journeys that he has accidentally bumped into Luke? This is the second time that happened. Previously, he had wanted to go to Ephesus, but the doors were shut, and then the doors were shut, and he bounced all the way to Troas, where he there led Luke to faith. And now, another happenstance by the Lord, it happened to be a plot to kill him, diverts his plans, he goes all the way, and there finds in Philippi, Luke again. Do you guys know how different church history would be? Do you know how different our Bible would be without Luke? So let's pause here and let's discuss about our control over life's plans. Any of us in this room a confessed control freak? Yeah, there you go. I got one hand. One hand. The rest of you, you're good. You guys just relax. I'm going to talk to him. (laughs) 
Proverbs 16, 9. In his heart, man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. All right, hear me say this up front. Guys, it is good, it is right for us to plan our ways. It, it's what part of being made in God's image is. Jesus said, right, only a fool would begin to build a tower and not have planned out if he have enough resources to finish it. God made us with the ability to reason and to understand our days and cost and, and what it takes to accomplish projects and, and the cost of chasing our dreams, all of that. Okay, you ask the question, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you say, I want to be a teacher or I want to be a, a policeman. There, there is a path, a course, steps that you need to take to go through in order to accomplish. All of that is good. In his heart, man plans his ways. But we must hold those plans loosely. You see, Paul purposed in his heart to go to Jerusalem by Passover. And then there was a plot to kill him. So that got changed. Okay? He also has plans after Jerusalem to go to Rome. He's done these missionary journeys and he is longing to go and to visit Rome. Additionally, after that, he would love to keep going west. He dreams of going all the way to Spain, okay? Going far and beyond. He wants to keep going, keep going. As long as God gives him energy and life and breath in his lungs, he will keep going. Those are his plans. Proverbs 16, 9. In his heart, man plans his way but the Lord directs his steps. We must hold our plans loosely. And secondly, we must not waste time lamenting a ruined plan. Any of you guys remember the movie from about 20 years ago, Napoleon Dynamite? It was great. It was great. I was in my young 20s. It's an absolutely ridiculous, silly teen movie, okay? But I loved it. That's my sense of humor. In that movie, there was a character named Uncle Rico. And Uncle Rico lived in the past, okay? He, he walked around with super tight shirts and he would push his arms out like this, try and make it look like he had big muscles. And he was, he was always reminiscing about his days as a high school football player. And he had this line where he would say, anytime, anytime he would settle and he would get quiet, his mind would begin to drift and he would dream. And he would always say, if coach had put me in, we'd have won state and I'd have gone pro and I'd be making millions right now. You see... If that one thing hadn't happened and ruined all of his plans, if that one thing, see, he was stuck lamenting the ruined plans of life. Now, this isn't about Uncle Rico. This is about you. Because how many of us are held in the grips of what ifs and ruined plans? Rather, we are called to be prepared to adapt. Paul wisely avoided danger, okay? He saw that it was God's provision that allowed him to realize the plan, that there was a plan on his life. He let go of his plans of getting to Jerusalem by Passover, okay? He changed his route, and suddenly now his plans are that he would get to Jerusalem by Pentecost, and number four, always important for us to remember that your adaptation was always God's plan A. The gospel of Luke, the book of Acts was always God's plan A. Even if it was Paul's plan C or D. Beloved, God is on his throne 
weaving the tapestry of your life together. And even if you can't see it, even if it feels chaotic, because your plans have been crumbled up and thrown out the window, God is still on his throne. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Amen? God's plan A, it always works out. Amen. (laughs) So Paul and his entourage, they meet up in Troas. Now, I only have time to quickly narrate this. So we're, gonna, we're still looking at, at the early parts of chapter 20. But I am certainly now more than ever convinced that Paul was a Baptist preacher. So in his final night at Troas, Paul had much to say. And Luke records for us in verse 7, he says, he says Paul was, had a prolonged message a prolonged message. And about midnight, there is a boy named Eutychus who is sitting in the window seal. And, Paul, uh, and Luke really wants you to understand. Look at it. He says it in verse 9. And as Paul kept on talking, Eutychus in the window seal falls asleep. He falls out the second story window and dies. Okay, imagine the commotion of that moment, the hysteria of everyone there. They go downstairs, Paul lays on him very much like Elijah and Elisha and raises him from the dead. And then, because Paul had to be a Baptist preacher, goes back to long preaching and talking the rest of the time. Right? If, if you were there and you're thinking, certainly a death and a resurrection is going to end this service. It didn't. It kept going. Now Paul is headed to Jerusalem by Pentecost. He is to deliver the financial collection that he had taken from church to church. It is a big deal for him to give that as an offering to uh, the Jews Uh, Jewish Christians there in Jerusalem as, as a way of saying that we are one church. That's a big deal for him to give that to him. And then he wants to celebrate Pentecost one last time in Jerusalem. And then he, he plans to go on to Spain. But remember, he's holding those plans very loosely because there is something really important that is also going on here. So I want to show you throughout Acts 20 and 21. On his way back through, he lands in Miletus, and he meets with the Ephesian elders. This is where we were last week. But look at verses 22 through 24 of chapter 20. Paul, speaking to them, tells them. He says, and now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and affliction await me. But I do not consider my life of account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. You see, Paul, who repeatedly avoided danger along his missionary journeys. You guys remember that? I've tried to point it out over and over again. Paul avoided lots of danger out of wisdom including right here, right earlier, right? He avoided getting on that ship. But he is now certain that the Holy Spirit is calling him to go to Jerusalem. He says, I don't know what will happen there, except that the Spirit of God has told me that bonds and affliction await me. How's that for an ominous calling from the Lord? And the Ephesian elders weep 
greatly, knowing that this is the last time they will see his face. Then if you pick up in chapter 21, in verse 3, Paul lands in Tyre. He's left Miletus, and now he's landed in Tyre. In 21 verse 4, the church comes out to him, okay, meets Paul again, and now the scripture says, through the Spirit, they begin to warn him not to set foot in Jerusalem. But Paul is convinced that the Spirit has called him, and he sets his face toward Jerusalem, and he presses on. Next, he goes to Caesarea, where he will stay in the home of Philip. You guys remember Philip from earlier in the book of Acts. While he's at Philip's house, a prophet comes from Judea, travels all the way to Samaria, a prophet named Agabus. Verse 11 of chapter 21. And coming to us, he reaches over and he took Paul's belt. And then he bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now remember, Jesus was handed over to the Gentiles and crucified. And when we heard this, verse 12, we as well as the local residents, that we is is Luke, and, and the people that are traveling with Paul, okay? We, along with the local residents, began begging him not to go to Jerusalem. He's begging them. His whole entourage is begging him. Don't go, Paul. Listen to his reply in verse 13 and 14. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of our Lord Jesus. I am ready to die for the name of Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. Now, as we've walked through the book of Acts, guys, I have tried to show us over and over again that Paul's faith is not static, okay? This has been a journey of faith, one that many, many times has stretched him to his limits where he thought he could not go on any further And just like when you work out, you completely break down the muscle, but then it grows back stronger. Paul's faith grew back stronger. That that is what's been going on. So many times he wanted to quit and run the other way and hide. He prayed for boldness. He told the churches, pray for boldness for me, that I would continue on, that I would not stop, that I would finish the course. In fact, do you recall how Jesus tenderly came to him in a vision when he was in Corinth and reminded him, look, there's not going to be any harm or persecution in this city. You can stay a while. Because he was at his absolute end of faith. Guys, this is very important for each of us to understand this aspect of growing in faith, right? Lest we label him a superhero, okay? Who who is naturally gifted with so much more faith than us that we're just like, well, you know, that was Paul. And we, and we do the same with Jesus, okay? We're like, well, that was Jesus. He's the son of God. I could never be like that. You have to understand. Hebrews chapter five tells us explicitly that Jesus learned the obedience of faith. That the exact same growing in faith took place in our Lord and Savior, the Son of God, okay? That when he got to the Garden of Gethsemane, that he had already gone through trial after trial after trial in his life that was leading him to that climactic moment, 
okay? I tell you all of that because Paul grew in faith, okay? And Jesus grew in faith. Faith is not static. And so you and I, let's not be discouraged about our own process of growing in faith. God is working out faith in you for particular moments for you to shine in the glory of what he's calling you to. Now, I told us at the beginning that this story of scripture, I place it as one of the heroic acts of faith, second only to Jesus' march towards the cross. And the reason it gives me such hope is because it's an example of history-shaking faith available to us this side of the cross. Paul, obedient to the Spirit of God, okay? He heads towards Jerusalem with all the warnings that bonds and affliction await me. You ask him, Paul, what is on the other side of Jerusalem? And he will say, I don't know. It is all dark. But I am ready to be bound and I'm even ready to die if that's the Lord's will. So the question that we should be asking this morning is what is Paul believing that gives him such courage, such faith? What is he believing There's a statement that he will write after he's imprisoned in the letter that we call Philippians, Philippians chapter one. I think this statement that I'm about to read for you shows us exactly what he's thinking. Philippians one verses 19 and 20. Paul says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Now he's in prison when he's writing this. And so you might think, oh, Jesus has told him he's gonna be released from prison. Good for you, Paul. But that's not the case, okay? I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and through the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything but that with all boldness, Christ will, even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. I'm going to read that one more time. I know it's theologically packed. So that provision that he talks about at the beginning, he says at the end, I don't know whether I'm going to live or die. That provision is what he says is that Christ will be exalted. I want to read it one more time. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and through the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my expectation and hope. So this is his hope and expectation. This is what he is believing in, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will Even now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. All right, what is he saying? I can't lose. He's saying, I can't lose. If I live, if I go to Jerusalem, and if I live, it was God's plan. And then I will go to Rome and I will go to Spain and I will glorify Jesus with every breath in my body. If I go to Jerusalem and if I am bound by chains and I spend years wasting away in jail, God will use it for good. The gospel will go forward because of my imprisonment. I don't know how that would take place, but even in prison, God will use that for the gospel to go forward. And even if I die, if I'm like John the Baptist, whose head is served on a platter, 
I will not be put to shame in anything, but God would use even that shame, even that circumstance to vindicate me, and my faith will be used for the glory of God. He says, I can't lose. I can't lose. Guys, notice he isn't just saying, if I die, I get Jesus. He will say that next. When I die, I get Jesus. For me to live is Christ, die is gain. I get Jesus. But here he's actually saying something more. That when you and I walk by faith, God promises that Christ will be exalted in you. That's what it, whether you live or die, there is nothing can, that can take that away. Christ will be exalted through your act of faith and obedience and stepping out. That is why he marches towards Jerusalem, called by the Spirit, even though persecution awaits. And guess what? God did more than he ever could have imagined. He will be captured and spend years in prison. But he will give testimony before kings and for, before governors, before the entire Sanhedrin. And he will go all the way to Rome. And while he is in prison, he will write large portions of New Testament letters that are now our Bible. And he will finally make it to Rome. And history records that he will be released and he will get his fourth missionary journey and that he will make it all the way to Spain. He will be captured again and then he will die a martyr's death. But in everything, Christ was magnified far greater than anyone could have ever imagined. No one knew God's plan. Here in Paul's life, it's completely dark outside of Jerusalem. And he goes willingly by faith because he says, I trust him. I trust him. He will. He has promised me he will be glorified by my obedient faith. And history is filled with stories of men and women of courage who said, I cannot be put to shame in anything. John Patton and his wife Mary felt called to be missionaries to, uh, uh, to the New Hebrides Island and were warned by one church member named Mr. Dixon who says, but you will be eaten by cannibals. This was John's reply. Mr. Dixon you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is that you will soon be laid in the grave, and there you will be eaten by worms. <laughs> so I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day of my resurrected body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our Redeemer. William Tyndale, who was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. Lottie Moon, who as a single woman on the mission field, served in China for 40 years, evangelizing and planting countless churches through plague and famine and various wars. And tens of thousands of names that we will never know this side of heaven, who have all in courage risen up and said, I cannot be put to shame in anything. Christ will be glorified in me, whether I live or whether I die. And those same promises apply to us, to you and I this morning, as we are called to live by faith. 
So as a mom or a teacher or an engineer or a student or a husband or as a friend and a neighbor, as you step out in faith, loving and serving and giving and going, right? Laying down your rights so that the gospel of Jesus will shine through you. Are there going to be obstacles and setbacks and disappointments and hurts and betrayals and scars? Yes, we know that. We know that, but your father has promised you good out of suffering and vindication out of shame. So beloved, I pray that this morning our faith is stirred. I pray it's stirred. And I want to ask you, What act of faith has God been calling you to? That in your heart, it's it's met with fear and opposition and you've been delayed and you've been thinking about all the what ifs and, and you look back at some of those plans that got disrupted and have been, haven't looked nearly like what you thought they would look. And maybe you're met with discouragement. What would it look like for you this morning to say yes to the Spirit of God and to step out in faith? Will you pray with me? A Heavenly Father, right now all across this room, I pray that we would be men and women, young and old, of faith, that trust you, that know that without faith it is impossible to please you, because we believe that you are a rewarder of those who seek you. Father, we pray that you would make much of our short, time-constrained life. That you would make much of our days by giving us courage and strength of faith to believe your promises and to have the courage to step out and to say yes. Yes, Lord. I believe that I cannot be put to shame in anything but that you will be glorified in me. We believe that. Father, meet us in our discouragement, in our hope. Meet us in our hurt and in our scars. Lift our heads and give us hope. Remind us of your promises. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen.